Hey, I love this time of the year. Anybody else love autumn? Love autumn. I was talking to one of the dudes. I don't know. He might be in the house. I can't see. But he said his favorite part of autumn is he gets to wear boots and a sweatshirt. I love that. <laughs> Little metro, but that's all right, huh? No problem. So I don't know what it is about this time of the year, though. But, you know, people are always asking me, especially dudes, are always asking me about this beard. I mean, you, you can ask Debbie about it. It's uncanny. Strangers walking down the street will just come up. Uh, people in restaurants, it happens all the time. And it's happened more lately, maybe because of the sweatshirt thing, or maybe they think this is an accessory for the season. I don't really know. But I was at a restaurant just a couple of nights ago with a guy, and we're sitting there, we're eating, and a guy comes literally, and he just stands there looking down at our table. And I'm thinking he's checking out our meal, but he, I look up at him, you know, like in mid-bite, and he goes, awesome beard, dude. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to go back to eating. <laughs> Just random things like that. The two questions they always ask, absolutely true. They ask me, how long did it take you to grow it? And how long do you plan on growing it? I get asked those all the time, total strangers. So you want some of the inside scoop? All right. So I basically started growing this beard when we started the Haven. And the longer it's grown, the more this has grown. Coincidence? I think not. I got one word for you, Samson. <laughs> and as far as how long am I going to grow it, let me just tell you, based on how God is blessing and everything, by next Christmas, I'm going to be wearing it as a scarf, all right? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying. <laughs> That's an awesome picture, right? <laughs> Debbie is rebuking me over there on the front row. So anyway, glad you're here. We just enjoy our time together, and I really uh, am enjoying my part of preparing things on this journey in the Word as we've started a new series based on the life, the adventure, the example of a man named Joseph. Let me do a little recap of last week just to bring us all up to speed. First of all, last week in part one, we called it No Straight Lines. We look at this young man's life and we realize it is parallel with ours in that it seems we rarely get so much momentum before God puts a little curve in the road and, and maybe a, a twist and a turn. And it just seems like we're, we're constantly having to keep on our toes, which we are. It's the walk of faith. And we looked at a verse in Philippians to just launch the whole thing because it is going to be a common theme through his life and the parallel to ours. And in, first, uh, in Philippians 1, 6, I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ returns or the day when our time here on earth is done. Now, this is a wonderfully encouraging scripture. It's a promise for you as an individual. The beginning is being drawn to God's heart through Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit, accepting Him as Savior. The continuing is every time we gather, every time you read that text blast and are inspired to think on the Lord, every time you have a devotional, go to a small group, whatever it is, every time you allow to God do anything in your life to help you grow, that's the process, and He's very much involved. It's continuing tonight at this very moment. And one day, it'll be finished. And between here and there, a lot is going to happen. Now, let me just lay the groundwork on some of the facts of Joseph. First of all, he's 17 years old when we meet him. He's 110 when he dies. Thirteen chapters in the book of Genesis are written about Joseph. I mentioned uh, he takes up more space in Genesis than any other subject or any other character. His father, Jacob, was about 90 when Joseph was born. I'm going to save comment because I did last week, so I won't this week. He was a shepherd, a biblical hero, a patriarch, and most definitely as we study him, we see he's a foreshadow of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. But as we peel back the story of his life last week, we realize that he came from a very, very dysfunctional family. And yet through all those things, the family background, youthful mistakes, his pride, his presumption, even betrayal, God used Joseph. That's so encouraging for us. God can use you and I despite our background. We kind of wrap things up as the Holy Spirit settled in this room. And I said, your family background neither qualifies nor disqualifies you from being part of God's wonderful plan. Anybody happy about that tonight? Man. Yes. So when we last left off, 
Joseph was in a mess. Setting up the verse that we'll, we'll do a little review and move forward tonight. Setting up that verse. Joseph's father, Jacob, says to him, I want you to go find the brothers. They're out tending the flock. When you study it, you realize it took Joseph five days of traveling through the wilderness, the desert, to find his brothers. Goes to one town, they're not there. Goes to another, he inquires about them. Five days he's traveling. Now it must be noted that he's also traveling in that coat of many colors. That coat that represented a lot of things. Some of it good, at that moment some of it not so good. It represented his status, it represented his birthright, it represented his favor with his father. And at that moment, traipsing around the brown desert in a colorful jacket, it also represented a little bit of pride. So Joseph finally sees his brothers, and as he comes a distance, Scripture we reviewed last week, Scripture says that the hatred that was in their hearts toward him over his favoritism from his father and all that stuff, that hatred began to boil over into murder. They began to plot and conspire how they're going to kill their own brother out there in the desert. And they end up just taking that obnoxious coat off of him and throwing him in a well that had no water in it. That's where we left it last week in Genesis 37, 28. He's in that pit. They decide not to kill him. But some traders come by, Midianites, and so Joseph's brothers pull him out of the well, and they sell him for 20 pieces of silver. And the traders took him to Egypt. Now, if you just look at that last sentence, they took Joseph to Egypt. It sounds so benign, doesn't it? They just took him. It's like he may have caught a cab or something and just headed to the big city. He was going to, to Egypt, just took him. He got out his phone. He hit the Uber act. He took a ride. But that is not exactly how it happened. It actually was a very cruel and, and punishing time. For if you look at Psalm 105, it gives us a glimpse into what happened. Psalm 105, 18 tells us this. They bruised Joseph's feet with shackles. They placed his neck in irons. Picture anything you've seen historically of slavery and how brutal and cruel it was. That's where Joseph finds himself. In a second, in a moment, everything has changed. His life of favor, his life of relative ease. He worked some, but not a lot. He had his father's blessing. He had this coat, and all of a sudden, that goes in a moment. And he finds himself with a cuff around his neck and shackles on his feet that were bruising them, his life had changed exponentially in one sentence. So I want to call part two in this series, I didn't see that coming. You see, in our walk, in our experience, there are going to be those moments when the phone rings. And it turns our world upside down. I've had them. There are going to be those moments when the boss walks in and gives you a notice that changes your whole world, sends it upside down. Maybe there's going to be one of those doctor visits. when they come in and they sit you down and they tell you something that is going to rock your world and turn your world upside down. That's what Joseph was experiencing. That's how quickly it can change on our journey in a moment. But I want to tell you, it's in those moments. See, it seemed like probably to Joseph in that pit, which, by the way, Scripture tells us in Genesis 42 that his brothers heard him screaming out for help before they picked him up and sold him into slavery. It was a time of great mental anguish. And so it can be when things shift for us, when they, when they change and they seem to be spiraling out of control. Although it seems to be out of control, I can tell you from Joseph's life, from the Word of God, from the anointing of the Holy Spirit and personal experience, God is always working. Because He's the one that began. And He's the one that continues. And He will be the one that finishes His work, His design in your life even when it seems crazy. Let me tell you something I firmly believe in, in a, a life of faith. The strength of our relationship with the Lord is revealed in times of trial. 
See, any relationship, any interpersonal relationship is a piece of cake when everything's great. How many married people in the house tonight? If you're married, raise your hand. Awesome. Me too. So one thing I can tell you, use my own life as an example, is that Debbie and I have been married a long time, and really, honestly, there are times when our marriage is like a Hallmark Channel movie. You know when those times are? About three days into vacation. Been together for a couple days unwinding. No kids, no pets. They're by ourselves. Relaxing and chilling. By about day three, it goes something like this. Debbie leans over to me and she'll say, Paul, what do you want to do today? And vacation, Paul, he looks back at her and says, whatever you want, babe. Whatever you want to do, that's what we'll do. And then about four days into the vacation, maybe five days, we'll get up in the morning and Debbie will say, Paul, yes, baby. What do you want to do today? What's your plan? And vacation, Paul, will look back and say, what do you want to do, babe? Whatever you want to do is fine with me. Now, reality, Paul, is probably going to say something like, listen, I got, I got a lot going on. And reality, Paul might say, like, I, I, I don't mind going out to eat, but things are a little tight. And, you know, I don't want to go there, and I don't want to go with them, and I don't want to eat that. That's reality, Paul. <laughs> Vacation, Paul, is whatever you want, babe. I feel the love. Now, listen, it's wonderful to get away. It's wonderful to have those moments. It really does help. Debbie loves me more when we get back. She really likes vacation, Paul. But you can't stay there. Same in our relationship with God. Part of the process of strengthening our relationship with Him is walking through those times when it all changes in a heartbeat and all we have left are our confused thoughts and the faith that we profess in Him. One of the reasons I keep telling you guys often, take pictures of certain promises that I post, is not to promote things. It's for you to get a hold of it and tuck it away and use it in your own personal arsenal in your fight against doubt and your fight in times of discouragement. I can't do it for you. I'll provide you the weapons. you got to swing the sword. There's a verse in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 13. He's talking to Christians and he says, dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange is happening. Sometimes when we get knocked for a loop, we're thinking, I didn't see that coming. But if we're making progress, and especially if we're making progress as in the enemy's territory, there are going to be things that are come our way that are going to be challenging. And they're going to require a fight. The Apostle Peter goes on to say, instead of being worried and thinking strange, instead of that, how about you be glad? Why? Because these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have a wonderful joy at seeing his glory when it's revealed to all the world. He is again reminding us in the darkest moments, in those trials that seem to hit us and knock us to a loop, and we're, we're struggling to find our footing. In those moments, we can be partners with Christ, and one day he'll reveal his glory to us and through us in our eternal reward. He shifts our perspective. It's very it's very vital in those moments when everything seems to get shaken up. And here's one thing I, I just, I, I like to, I got to keep it real. I just want to make it so practical. I don't want to just be up here and giving you, you know, these, these really broad spiritual terms and nobody gets it. So, so let me break it down a little tonight because we are all going to go through those moments when we say, I didn't see that coming. Now there's an interesting verse in an obscure book of the Bible many of us have not read. It's called the Song of Solomon. And I'm going to bring up something there because I believe it pivots off that one sentence in the story of Joseph where we've camped out tonight. That in a, in a moment he went from the, 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 the joyful life to a pit to slavery in absolute bondage and had to be going out of his mind. And that verse in Song of Solomon is this. Catch the foxes for us. 
the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. How does that fit? Here's how I believe. Because you see, at our moment of distress, there is always going to be some little thing that's going to gnaw away at your faith. It's going to gnaw away at your confidence in God. There's going to be those moments of absolute questioning. It's like the little foxes, the analogy here, that got into a very healthy vineyard and began to chew away at the fruitfulness that was going on. So I believe as a pastor, a friend, as a brother, I can sound some alarm tonight. In your moment of distress, guard the little creatures, the little things that can get in and gnaw away at your confidence in God. Let me illustrate a little bit for you tonight if I can. So I've shared some of my adventures with you over our journey. Many of you have been part of it that back in the early 2000s, my ministry role was I was what's called an evangelist. Uh, I would travel to various churches, and I would kind of do what I did tonight. I would lead in worship as a guest. I would, I would share a message, and then I would move on and go to another church. And I, I did that for a few years, wonderful uh, ministry, and just, just enjoyed it so much. And, and uh, we'd go to some places every year that have us come back. And one particular journey we would take, Debbie and I and Amanda, is we would go to upstate New York. I've shared some of those stories over the, our time together. And uh, do ministry, do concerts. I would do various things like that. So it was probably 2004, maybe 2005. We were heading to upstate New York. We were heading to the little town of Clayton, New York. We were going to begin a week of concerts and services up there at that place where the red dot is, way up, way up in New York State. Now, Clayton, New York is a really quaint little town on the St. Lawrence River in the Thousand Island region. If you look at the top of the picture, that green mass, that's... Canada. It's way up there, but it's really quaint. And I will say, if you ever plan to go there, only go in the summer, which is like two weeks in July. Seriously, it's the longest winters you've ever seen. A friend of mine from up in that area last week, I'm not kidding, posted a picture. He woke up and there was a dusting of snow. What? So we went up there in the summer, we go up there in July, and we're heading there, and I was actually starting the week of ministry at First Baptist Church in Clayton, New York. They asked me to come, they do two Sunday morning services, I say, okay, I'm going to come, I'm going to do it, I'm going to you know, just try to be a blessing to you guys. And so we, we go up, and we stayed at this hotel about 30 minutes away, and it's Sunday morning, and we're driving in, it's a beautiful Sunday morning, sun is shining, no clouds in the sky, we're on our way, it's probably 7.30 in the morning on a Sunday, and my cell phone rings in the car. I look at it, and it's the pastor. Now, this could go one of two ways. He's either calling to ask me how I like my coffee so we can have it waiting when I get there, which was not what happened. Or he's got bad news. I pick up the phone, and he just blurts it out. Paul, I got bad news. All right, pastor, what is it? He said, we have no electricity this morning. Now, I'm supposed to be playing a keyboard, singing on a microphone, having slides, doing a lot of things that require electricity. So my mind begins to turn. He says, listen, actually our whole block has no power. He said, here's what happened. He said, somewhere in the night, a squirrel got in the transformer. And the act of mischief and vandalism cost this rodent his life and blew the transformer. And I'm going, what? He says, Paul, I'm afraid to tell you that we're just not going to have any power this morning. We're going to have to figure out what to do. And I must tell you, I did not see that coming. It's the first of a week of ministry. This is not a a, a portent good of things to come. This is a little bit of a a bad way to start off, but I'm talking to the pastor. Okay, what are our options? What can we do? I I don't play guitar. i got to play a piano. He says, well, we just happen to have this piano, but it's really old. It's on the side of the sanctuary. It has not been played in many years, and I'm picturing something like this, you know. I'm picturing I'm going to be sitting at the the original piano that the psalmist David played, you know, something like that. And and he says, listen, you you can use the piano, and you have to play real hard because it doesn't sound real good. And you have to sing real loud because they won't hear you. And, oh, by the way, you'll just have to sing hymns. What? He goes, yeah, we have no screens, no lyrics, but we have books in the 
in the, in the rack of each of the seats. So now my mind is going, I'm not prepared for this. I've got, you know, 20 minutes before I get there, and I'm trying to think what hymns do I remember and, and, and all that's just going through all of it. So I get there, and I start to play, and God actually was such a, he blessed so much that night. He was so faithful that, that morning. As we got in there and the congregation came in and the only light we had was the sun coming through the stained glass windows. It kind of had this really cool vibe in it and everybody kind of was sort of excited. Like, this is really different. And I'm sitting over way on the side. I was facing away from them. It was so awkward, but I just sang my heart out. And they began to sing. And the sweet presence of God filled that room. We started singing some of the old hymns, Amazing Grace, and things like that. And it was so different than I had planned on. And yet, God used it. And, and as the lights finally came on before the second service and the place was filled and we went back to our regular program, I, I kind of missed what we had in the first service. It had this just organic blessing to it. It just had this uniqueness that we, we allowed God to just come in and use us despite things being thrown on its ear. Now, I found... In times of extreme or sudden crisis or when things really get turned on their ear, that many times it's the little things like the little doubts, like those little foxes, or if I can say it, those little squirrels that get in and can gnaw away at our peace, at our confidence, at our joy. So let me talk to you for a few minutes in this message. Watch out for the squirrels. Watch out for the squirrels. When you go through the trial, when you begin to feel the rattling of your, your, your foundation in a time of great testing, watch out for the little things that get in. And by squirrels, of course, it's those things that gnaw away. You can just see it. You can feel it sometimes as your peace and your faith begin to ebb away. Let me go over a couple of them tonight just to help you get this. First, the squirrel of undisciplined thoughts. I can tell you one thing. The first battle you will fight in times of distress will be right here in your mind. In her book, Battlefield of the Mind, Joyce Meyer has a wonderful quote, many of them actually, and I love this one. You cannot have a positive life and a negative mind. The first thing that will happen as things begin to get turned upside down, you get that call, you get that word from the doctor, whatever the crisis is, whatever the magnitude, the first thing that will happen is it's going to want to shake your confidence in God. And it's going to begin to fill you with negativity. Isaiah 26.3 gives us some of the remedy. He says, God, you will keep in perfect peace whose trust is in you, all whose thoughts, it's in the mind, whose thoughts are fixed on you. I can tell you in those times of distress and the gnawing away at your peace and faith come through doubt in God, you got to get in his presence. you got to find that place of peace. That word fixed from the original word is steadfast, to lean on, to lay on, rest on, or be supported by. Now that is a comforting picture of our God in times of distress. Joseph had a solid relationship with God, even as a young man. God was talking to him, giving him dreams, showing his future, and yet here he is just spiraling out of control. But you and I, in those moments, if we'll resist it, if we'll allow the word of God to put up a standard against it, we can feel the steadfastness of our peace leaning on God. Philippians 4.8 is another one you need to know. And now, dear brothers and sisters, Paul says to this group of Christians one final thing. This is what he leaves them with. He says, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. I'm telling you, if we will discipline our thought life, it can get us through the initial barrage when things just knock us for a loop. We peel it back a little bit. The word fixed in this particular Greek word means to implant them in your heart. Oh, I'm telling you, God wants to implant in your heart peace in the middle of your storm. He wants it to go deep so it's not just surface, but it gets to the depth of your soul. Here's another one you got to watch out, another squirrel, and that's the one of bitterness. Oh, boy. Many of us have been there. 
had a situation in my life as a young man where I got stricken with a back ailment. I was on disability for 314 days, consecutive days in my 20s. I'm telling you, I had times where I just looked up and I said, God, what have I done? God, why me? And then you begin to get a little bitter and you begin to get angry and say, God, why? Well, you know, what's the deal here? Haven't I served you? Begin to show them your resume. It happens. It's part of the human condition when things do get out of control. But I can tell you this, unchecked bitterness will bring us down. Unchecked bitterness will develop a critical spirit. You'll begin to look at everything negative. It's got to be dealt with. And here's the beautiful thing. Scripture tells us, basically, that we can make a choice. Philippians 4.13, we have the power to get rid of all bitterness. How do we do it? Fill your thoughts with God's word. Put on worship music. Get around people that are positive influence on you. Those that speak life into you. That bitterness will get in and it will gnaw away at your confidence. The implication on this word in the original is something very toxic, poisonous, or the analogy is deadly to the touch. God's word is saying in your time of crisis, you've got to resist bitterness at all costs. Bitterness is a choice. If we develop that discipline in our lives, God will give us the degree of strength we need. Let me give you one more of these little buzzards. Neglecting time in God's presence. Oh, I have found that in crisis time, eventually we begin to go, what's the use? God knows what I need. I, I, I just have found that sometimes that the very thing that's our lifeline actually begins to erode. I put this verse in the uh, text blast this week to you, the wonderful part of the Haven community, because I could just feel God stirring this for this weekend. First Chronicles 16, 11, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually, longing to be in his presence. Oh, I can tell you, when those little things come in and start gnawing away, gnawing at your peace, begin to bring in doubt, Begin to feel some things fraying at the edges. I tell you, if you get in his presence, you can turn it all around and lift up praise to him. It begins to fill. It begins. That just wasn't right. It begins to fill your heart with that hope again. It begins to lift up the joy inside. We're all going to be in those places where we say, where did that come from, God? And it's okay to have moments of introspection. But one thing is for sure. We're going to see it in our continuing study of Joseph is as he went on his journey, and as he allowed God to restore his strength, just as with you and I, God will take those moments, God will take those exercises in our faith, holding steady because we believe in him and his character, and he allows that to bring us greater strength. And we come out of the thing that should have knocked us down for good, and we can come out of it even stronger. I've seen it. I've lived it. I'm encouraging you tonight that the power in God's word through those times of perplexity, the power of his presence, there is such value to gathering in a setting like this, wherever it may be, where we can just be accepted by each other, accepted by God, and allow him to talk to us, to settle our spirit, and to renew our strength. In the next place we're going in Joseph, I actually want to end tonight with this. Genesis chapter 39 verse 2 says that the Lord was with Joseph in Egypt even though he was a slave. He succeeded and he prospered in everything he did. God didn't abandon him. Oh, far from it. God was right there. And as a matter of fact, God was in front of him, around him, behind him, all involved in his life just as he is in you. And when he got to that place, still a slave. You notice he's not set free yet, but he's still prospering and succeeding. Why? Because somewhere in that journey from that pit and that caravan and his neck being strangled and his ankles being constricted, he stayed true to God. And God said, I'm with you. Hang on. It's all going to turn around. I'm telling somebody tonight in this house, hang on, hang on. It's going to turn around. And you may not be free right away, 
but you're going to feel free in your spirit. You may still have some of the shackles of the situation, but you can feel free in your heart. Why? Because God is faithful to his word. Bow your heads tonight with me. Father, thank you so much for your word and this time. Father, thank you for the stillness of your spirit. Thank you, God, that we, we can be comforted by your presence, and we are. And now, Lord, I, I ask in these closing moments that, that you just allow it to settle into our hearts. The precious seed of your word. And that we'll hear the voice of the Lord saying, I'm with you. Even when you feel that you're being strangled by the situation. I'm with you. Even when you feel like your cries of anguish are not reaching me. God is saying tonight, I hear them and I'm with you. And it's through this that he will develop a strength and you will come out with a greater confidence in him. It's the way it must be sometimes. So hold steady and hold true. God is with you there. God is with you in that place. Keep your eyes on him. Give him opportunity. Read his word. Put on music that uplifts your heart. Keep your eyes on him. Let's close with this. Say, turn your eyes upon Jesus. blessing for you, especially the one that has absolutely had their world rocked this week. God sees you. God knows where you're at. If you tap in, if you give him an opportunity, when you leave this place and let this word continue to germinate in your soul, he is going to give you strength and grace. It is going to be a better week. God is with you. Father, I thank you for these moments, and I thank you, God, for your word. And I thank you for that one that you're talking to right now. And I pray that you would allow this word and this presence we feel to continue to bring strength in their hearts and their lives. Talk to them this week, oh God. Talk to them by your Holy Spirit in situations. Bring people in their lives that absolutely speak life and encouragement in their hour of need. I thank you for your faithfulness, Holy Spirit. I thank you. Come on, sing this one more time before we go. Say, turn your eyes upon Jesus. on Jesus this week. Keep your eyes on him. Keep your heart and your mind fixed on him. Steadfast. He'll bring his peace. That's what he promised. I love you guys. Let's enjoy some fellowship tonight in this place.